I am Georgia Salanti from the University of Bern and I will present you research that we have done together with Ethan Sacker, Tosi Furukawa and other colleagues to estimate the smallest worldwide difference of antidepressants. The use of antidepressants is one of the most debated topics in public health, with passionate advocates on both sides. Why some see those drugs as life-saving tools to manage depression and anxiety, others argue that they are overprescribed and have serious adverse events. Six years ago, we published a meta-analysis where we synthesized the results from more than 500 trials to estimate the effectiveness of 21 commonly prescribed antidepressants versus placebo. The primary outcome of this meta-analysis was response. This was defined as 50% or greater reduction in depression severity. On the graph on the left, you see the odds ratios for each antidepressant versus placebo. You see that all odds ratios, they are on the right hand side that favors the active intervention. The mean odds ratios ranged between 149 and 185. Assuming a 30% probability to respond to placebo, that is, spontaneous improvement, then a commonly prescribed class of drugs, the SSRIs, have an absolute increase in response between 10% and 15%. In other words, if you don't take any treatment, you have about 30% probability to get better. If you do get a treatment, then you will get better with a probability of 40% to 45%. The results from this meta-analysis, they were greeted with some enthusiasm, but also some skepticism. A major criticism was that the observed advantage of antidepressants over placebo is not clinically significant. The authors of the meta-analysis, including myself, and those who characterize the advantage of the antidepressants as clinically non-significant or questionable have something in common. We are all either psychiatrists, psychologists or researchers in mental health. However, it is only those who need the antidepressants that can judge whether this additional 15% in response is worthwhile or not. So, we set out to estimate the smallest worthwhile difference of commonly prescribed antidepressants compared with no treatment. The smallest worthwhile difference is the patient-preferred efficacy of antidepressants that would be deemed worthwhile compared with no treatment given the antidepressants' harms and inconveniences. We focus primarily on adults who show symptoms of depression as defined by a PHQ-9 score of at least 10, but do not receive any treatment. And we also surveyed people in treatment and people without depression symptoms in a secondary analysis. We conducted a cross-sectional survey using research participant crowdsourcing services. Prolific and MTurk represent a general internet population and participation was remunerated. Uh, MQ includes volunteers with lived experiences in mental health. To estimate the smallest worldwide difference, we used the benefit-harm trade-off method. It is a method that ascertains how much benefit people are willing to trade off for the expected burden of an intervention A over an intervention B, in our case of antidepressants, versus no intervention. It is a method that has been used to estimate the smallest worldwide difference in treatments for respiratory disease, for fall prevention and pain reduction therapies. The benefit-harm trade-off method works as follows. First, we present the potential side effects of antidepressants. Then we state that spontaneous improvement in response occurs in approximately 30 out of 100 people after two months without taking any treatment. And then we ask, 
if efficacy larger than this 30% would convince them to take the drug. Then, depending on the answer, we move to lower or higher efficacy numbers to identify the smallest response deemed worthwhile. The patient and public involvement group from the University of Oxford participated in this project. They reviewed the script of the survey and they also reviewed the description of the side effects of the antidepressants. They also helped us to interpret the results of the survey and participated in the writing up of the manuscript. Our study finally included 935 participants. 124 people were found with moderate to severe depressive symptoms but not in treatment. 390 people were in antidepressants. 495 people had absent to mild symptoms with or without treatment experience. It is interesting to note that about 10% of the people we reached out reported that they would not take any antidepressant even if these drugs achieve 100% response. These people were initially removed from the analysis but included subsequently in a sensitivity analysis. So we ended up with 104 participants with moderate to severe depressive symptoms but not in treatment who would consider potentially antidepressants and this is our primary sample that we analyzed. On the screen you see the frequency distribution of the smallest worldwide difference for people with moderate to severe depressive symptoms but not in treatment. On the horizontal axis you see the smallest worldwide difference ranging between 0% and 65% and on the vertical axis is the number of participants that deemed antidepressants worldwide at different thresholds. The median smallest worldwide difference was about 20%. Remember that the absolute increase in response with antidepressants was estimated between 10 and 15%. That was deemed worldwide for about 38% of the respondents. So our study showed that the current 15% benefit with the best available antidepressants is sufficient for one in three people with symptoms of depression. However, two in three people with symptoms of depression expect greater benefit. That means we need better, more efficacious and less burdensome medications to treat depression and anxiety. Additionally, the drug developing process and future clinical trials should consider patient expectations.